everybody, it's Romania Black, and normally I don't have my hair pulled back for reactions, but uh, it has been, as I'm recording this, like record, record temperatures, and so it has been a hot and humid and sweaty day. I like literally got a headache from the heat outside because I had to be outside for a lot of the day and just absolutely miserable, and so I thought to myself, what would make tonight better to round out the day? And the answer, of course, is Berserk. <laughs> so we're here on episode 10, and we left off at such a great place because now Griffith has Griffith has decided to make his boo his personal assassin. <laughs> I was like, what? Making Guts a hitman? That won't go well, right? Or maybe it will. I just, when I think of assassins, I think of, you know, stealth. I think of being, you know, not a blue, not um, obvious, you know, being somewhat inconspicuous. And inconspicuous and guts are two words that don't go together. <laughs> I feel like guts is so noticeable. He has such presence. I'm like, you need Kuroko to be your assassin, not guts. So yeah, I, how is this going to work? I'm very curious. We left off in some very interesting things with Griffith and Guts and about the court and what Griffith is trying to do. And I have my thoughts about that. It, it's funny. I saw my brother the other day and he was like, where are you at with Berserk? And I was like, oh, I'm, I just finished episode nine. And he was just like, okay, all right. And he's been very good about not spoiling. And so I said, I'm like, I know that based on episode one, the betrayal of Griffith with Guts is coming. And my brother, all he did, he was like walking to his vehicle as we were talking and he just like had this dark laugh and he went, <laughs> he went, um, yeah, betrayal. You, you don't know the meaning of that word. And I was like, what does that mean? And he's like, bye. And so I was like, Ugh. so yeah, I know it's coming. I know it's, it's happening, but that's what makes this so fascinating is because we see Guts and Griffith and right now they're chums, they're best friends, they could be boyfriends and they're just having the greatest of times. And you know, based on episode one, that things are going to go down, but you don't know how and how we're going to get there. That's kind of the best part is when you, you have a, an opening episode, give you a scenario. And then when you cut to the flashback, it's polar opposite. So you're just like, how did we get here? So... It's very interesting, very interesting. Um, the only comment that I have, speaking of the dynamics between Guts and Griffith, is uh, Melania the Sever talked about way back in episode four, uh, the idea of that naked that naked bathing scene with Guts and Griffith uh, seemed very similar to Kaoru from Neon Genesis when him and Shinji, I've compared Guts with Shinji, so is Griffith like Kaoru? I could see that. I could see that. So it also makes, the funny thing is though, you know, we in the manga for Neon Genesis, Kaoru and um, Asuka are kind of at odds. And here it's kind of opposite where Casca and Griffith are kind of working together. But like we said with Charlotte last episode, Casca may be seeing the writing on the wall. How does she feel about that? She clearly has feelings for Griffith, whether they're platonic or, or romantic. She respects him and like holds him up to such a high standard. How is Charlotte going to interpret that? How does that work? I... There's a lot of questions the last episode gave us, and I'm very curious to see what's going to go down. So, <laughs> so that's where we are with that, but I, I'm so curious. I couldn't wait, and it was so hot today. I was like, uh, what better way to cool down than to watch my comfort anime, <laughs> which is Berserk. So, yeah. I'm ready for that sweet alt rock opening and I'm ready to see how this goes down. I don't, Guts as an assassin, I think that he would do a fine job killing someone, but what making it stealthy and where nobody will like bring it back to Guts and be like, this was pretty obvious. How we doing this? But you know, it's Griffith making the request. So maybe Guts will go all out because it's Griffith telling him to. I don't know, but we're going to find out. We are going to start episode 10 of Berserk and see what we get. And we're going to do that here in three, two, one. And let's, uh, let's find out y'all. You know what I love about this series? That it just keeps building. It just keeps building and getting more complicated, more interesting. Griffith is terrifying. <laughs> and you know what? Guts and Casca developing a relationship. I'm, I'm here for it. I was like, yes, okay, good. Develop that relationship. Let's go. This episode had a lot to talk about. Um, <laughs> so Julius is dead. That... That part went well. It's just the fact that Guts killed like 20 other people. How long with that? A, a stealthy assassin 
guts is not. And I am amazed that nobody has figured out that it's him. But then again, nobody saw. The people that saw are dead. Nobody saw and lived. So I'm also amazed that, that we didn't we didn't see Griffith's reaction to all this. I mean, we saw it. Griffith was just like, bah, ha, ha. He looked quite evil in that moment. But but there's the thing about Griffith is that he's hard to read at times. And so you think, like when he was talking with uh, Foss, we got Humpty Dumpty slash Chaney's name. Uh, we finally got it. But Foss, when he's talking to Foss, I was like, he doesn't necessarily know that Foss was behind sending Julius, right? No, he knows. <laughs> no, he knows. And I think I think it's the fact that Foss brought it up. It's like you just outed yourself. Like how how much more obvious can you get when you're like, so people are dropping like flies around here. It's a shame nobody tried to like assassinate you or anything. <laughs> I'm just I'm just bringing it up so you won't suspect me, and then it makes him the most suspicious. So yeah, I'm just kind of floored that uh, that we need to talk about. Guts, maybe. Is Guts figuring things out? I don't think he is. <laughs> I don't think Guts is figuring things out. I was like, uh, Griffith pretty much lays it out on the line. Now, the fact of the matter is, did Griffith know they were there? Did he know he, they were listening? Uh, a part of me thinks that he could have. Part of me thinks Griffith could have known Guts was listening. Part of me thinks maybe he didn't. But we can all agree, he is the smoothest of operators. He, like, has Charlotte in the palm of his hand and I was expecting us to maybe get like the aftermath of showing us like in mourning where Griffith is like comforting Lady Charlotte and she's all dressed in black and you know have that and have maybe Griffith's reaction to Guts and Griffith talking to Guts being like so you killed 20 people more than I asked you to <laughs> that's called overkill but oh, but we don't get that so it's kind of interesting right it's fascinating in that regard of what do we do with this and we don't get to see the thing that's so frustrating is that when Griffith is leaving the court we, we focus on him for a hot second but we don't get what he's thinking this show is very particular that we are looking at things uh primarily through Guts's perspective and then if it's not through Guts's perspective it's like this third person omniscient narrator where we don't we're just a fly on the wall we don't necessarily get to see from anybody else's perspective except Guts we get to see inside Guts's mind that's it and everybody else we're just a fly on the wall seeing what Guts cannot so I, there, I want to know what's in Griffith's mind so much, but I know that that's the point. Griffith is our antagonist. He ends up becoming our antagonist. We're just not there yet. And uh, I just, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think this episode made, very, made it very clear that Griffith is not afraid to kill all of them. <laughs> I think that part was very clear. He's, he, they're not friends. He's using them. They're his noble soldiers who are his toys, his pawns. And he gets to decide where you live and die. And, like, chums? No, 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 no. I've just, he's got, Griffith's like, I've manipulated you all to follow me, but I don't care about you. <laughs> and, I'm, and I want Guts to realize that, and I feel like Guts is going to realize that all too late. It's going to be all too late when he realizes that Griffith, Griffith has strung him along, he is using him, and that is the extent of their relationship. But we need to get uh, into this episode. Of course, we have... Griffith saying, I want to ask you to kill a man for me. Nothing much. Just a man. And Guts, you know, does the immediate overkill. Now, the big question is, this episode's called Noble Man, right? A noble man, right? Guts is not that <laughs> whatsoever. So I'm going to put Griffith up here because Griffith is deserving of analysis in everything that he does and says. And I want to put Guts up here too, right? We're going to put Guts up here as well because we need to talk about him. I, I guess a big question in this is, did Griffith think that Guts was only going to kill Julius or was this, was the, the slaughter of Adonis and these guards part of his plan as well? Because it works out very much to his convenience because... Julius was like, oh, Adonis, my, you know, eight-year-old kid, you're going to grow up and marry Charlotte. She's going to wait till her 30s to marry you. I'm like, is she? And, I, you know, then you will have the throne secured. I'm like, okay. That part, I was like, but Julius is next in line for the throne because Charlotte is a woman. And so I'm like, all Julius, and Julius has a kid. So 
I'm like, why would you necessarily want Adonis to marry Charlotte? I guess to secure it so that Charlotte doesn't marry a guy and have a kid and, and there's that. I guess that's I guess that's the way you secure it, being like, well, if she gets married and has a son, that would automatically, you know, take precedence and then he would be heir, not me. So I'll have my son marry him and then we'll have everything all hunky dory. So I mean that makes sense. I felt bad I felt bad for Adonis throughout all of this because Adonis is just a kid. He just wants his father's affection and attention, and he ends up dying with, as as Hassan, the, the old man butler notes, he's like, he dies with nothing. He dies without his father's recognition, gets stabbed through the heart by a stranger, and then ends up with none of that. Like, he just dies this horrific death after witnessing his father's murder. Like, that's just absolutely awful. And it is what it is, right? There were a lot of references in this episode to other things in pop culture, and I'm sorry if I point them out, but I was just like, wow, this reminds me of this. It reminds me of that. Um, but uh, did Griffith imagine that Guts would kill Adonis and Julius? Or did it all, it all worked out to Griffith's favor? It's the behelot. It all worked out to his favor. He not only got rid of the one opposition he had to the throne, but he got rid of the second opposition they had to the throne. Like, just, there's nothing stopping him now! You know, and maybe, and that's kind of the crazy thing about it, the king, this just not only bolstered Griffith's status in the court, but now the king's like, well, crap, I don't, my brother's dead, my nephew's dead, there's nobody else in line for the throne, so my daughter has to marry somebody. Why? she can marry you, Griffith, because you're the most suited to be a king right now after me. Yep, I, I feel that that is exactly what is going to happen. But him, like, uh, and to, to be fair to Guts, he's not... Guts can be fairly stealthy. To be to be fair to Guts, he's a big hunking guy. You would think he'd not be stealthy at all, but he may just, like, crack, climb up the roof fairly well to get there. And he sees Julius fighting Adonis. One thing I really like about this series and about this episode is that they they portray like body shapes very realistically. Like like Julius is a buff man. Like he's got some thigh muscles, right? He's a pretty buff man. And even his son Adonis, like when we see them standing up on stage because he's at a distance, Adonis looked a lot smaller and maybe frailer. But then when you actually get up on him and see him in this episode, no, he's a pretty he's like a well-muscled kid. Like he's pretty athletic. And that's not what I was expecting from him. But his dad, like, being harsh and training him. Lots of Gambino comparisons. Guts, the thing that surprises me is that he can, he can be, and this shouldn't be surprising, he can be oblivious to many signs. He can be many, very oblivious. He's a, he is a himbo. He is a basic man, right? There is just, there is not, it's a, it's a good thing he's pretty. <laughs> it's pretty much it, right? He's just not a little lot. And I like that simplicity to Guts. I like that Guts is pretty simplistic. And that's fine because you have the, the foil of it is that Griffith is very complex and very calculating and manipulative. And Guts is just very straightforward. What you see is what you get. And, and for being, he's the protagonist that you see in a story that's kind of like the audience insert protagonist where he's as in the dark as we are with the story. And so when we follow along, we learn as he learns. So when you have a character like that, they almost have to kind of be simplistic because they're learning as the audience is learning and they grow as the audience grows with the story. So it makes sense. But Guts, Guts overlooks a lot of things. Like he sees Julius, he's like, oh, I'm in luck. And then he notices the kid. The kid's design is a lot like Rickert's. Uh, the way that his eyes are drawn and his hair, he looked like if Rickard and Judo had a kid, that would be him. And then he's like, who's that kid? Yeah, the genetics clearly are not in Julius or his brother's favor because their kids don't really look like them. They, they seem more like the parents. Um, Charlotte seems, I guess, like a combination of both of them, but Julius, Adonis did not take after his dad, right? Except maybe the fringe. But yeah, I, I feel for Adonis because he doesn't complain. He doesn't cry. That's the thing. He, like, he's yanked up by the hair by his dad and his dad is very harsh. But Adonis doesn't complain. He doesn't cry. He doesn't be like, I hate you, daddy. And like runs off. No, he's just very kind of obedient and like, okay, I'll do what you want, dad. If that means I get your attention. And he's like, were you really born? Like Julius is pretty cruel in this opening scene, right? Like, your enemies never will rest in battle. And Hassan is kind of like, hey, can we kindly call it a day? Like, you know, it's been a while. 
He says Adonis will someday become the commander of the White Dragon Knights, the land's strongest troop. Like, it very much is Julius is grooming Adonis to be all the things that he cannot right now. So he's just like, he's like the soccer dad that wants his son to be the, the tri-state athlete like he was. He's like, you're going to become leader of the Knights, and then you're also going to be... It's possible he'll marry Lady Charlotte and rule all of Midland. And Adonis just has this look on his face like, I didn't ask for any of this. I mean, granted, like, being the head knight of the White Dragon sounds fun, but Adonis being like, I really don't want to marry my cousin, but <laughs> hashtag win royalty, right? And so Julius is just putting all this pressure. He's like, those who are born into royalty must carry heavier burdens than those who are not. Hmm. Such a burden is his destiny. And and Adonis just kind of looks kind of, he kind of cringes at that. He looks a little bit, you know, like, where was my say in all of this with my fate and destiny? This series talks a lot about fate and destiny. And so poor Adonis, he doesn't really have much of a say in what happens to him. And it's kind of honestly sad that he just seems to kind of go with the flow because of his father telling him what to do. And he gets up and goes again. Like, he, he just wants to get that... He just wants to get that uh, accolade from his dad. And we see Guts watching him like he knows exactly what that's like. He can relate Adonis. He can relate Adonis versus Julius with him versus Gambino. And he does make that connection and that comparison later when he's in the sewers and he's having like his fever dream from the arrow. I'm glad the arrow wasn't poisoned. Seemingly, I'm glad that was the case because that would have been really bad. But he relates the two of them. We'll talk about that vision of him being the monster because that's really, really good. But the thing about it is, is that Julius, he's not, doesn't have a heart of stone. He says so much for today. Like he has that look and he grabs the towel and he throws it on his son. And he says, keep yourself warm and be ready for tomorrow. Like he's not a stone cold bastard. He's just really overworking his kid but it's not like he just spits on him and walks away right and then Hassan comes over to kind of smooth things over he says master Adonis he's like I'll treat your wounds and he's like your father is desperate as your only parent he's trying to raise you into a full-fledged knight so the mom is gone the mom is no longer and he's like he's just a single dad and he's overworked and he's desperate because he's worried about Griffith He's afraid of Griffith, and so he wants Adonis. He wants to make Adonis as appealing as Griffith, right? That is not easy, so or possibly attainable. So Hassan's just trying to be like, don't hate your father for trying. And he says, you should think not think ill of your father. And I just, I love the expression that Adonis has. Like, you know that Adonis doesn't hate his dad. He's just frustrated because he doesn't get a say in it. And there's a part of me that really wanted there to be more with Adonis' story, like with his character, but... The mangaka was like, nope, <laughs> you're not, nobody's safe in this story and you're not getting that because Guts is just like, oh my God, got to go do my job. It's interesting that Guts relates Adonis to himself and then ends up killing him. It's, is that a, is that a metaphor of Guts being self-destructive? Possibly. So we have this waterfall, this water fountain, this water fountain that is by the front of the palace. It is going to come up again. Those same steps, that same place. It's going to come up again with Guts uh, looking on at Griffith and Charlotte's conversation. Fun times. And we have, of course, in the tradition of all royal medieval things, a ball with everybody attending. Mm -hmm. I just love that Griffith is surrounded by all the girls. And they're all just like, they've cornered him trying to talk to him. Periwinkle looks very nice on him. It almost makes his eyes look more periwinkle than blue in this scene. So I wonder if his robes are actually meant to be like a light blue and it's just the coloring of the episode that's off. But the colors look really good on him. And he has like the frills and the frocks and his hair's all poofed up like an owl. Um, and he's like, I'm really more of a coward. Hmm. Uh, so he says that to the ladies. He says that to the ladies, that he's really more, more of a coward. And so they're talking about his exploits and everything and saving her. So I'm, I'm curious if that more of a coward line is just BS and just him just, you know, talking to the girls to be talking, or if it's referring to the fact that he couldn't kill Julius himself. He had to go get guts to do it. And that's why he thinks he's a coward. Because, yeah, he could have, you know, instead of doing the business himself, he has to use someone to kill him. So, 
what do we do with that? And that's when we see these two guys. I said Lord Raven and Lord Owen. The one guy looks like Owen Wilson from Wedding Crashers, and the other guy looks, um, oh God, he's Vince Vaughn from Wedding Crashers. So when they show up, I'm like, oh, you guys crashing the wedding? Okay. Like they just they just look like you're know, like, oh wow. Like just Owen Wilson and them. It's great. Raven and Lord Owen. So I don't know if these guys are going to be of any consequence or if they're just names. And they're like, what a terrible affair during the hunt. It's a good thing you didn't die. We nearly lost a vital asset of the Midlands army. And he's like, oh, my life is nothing. The only important thing is that Princess Charlotte is safe from harm. Uh, Griffith is just campaigning. He is politicking. He is like smooth as silk with everyone. He has, he's presenting himself in such a light that he seems like the perfect man. And it's like, hmm. And speaking of which, there's Charlotte. Now, I'll be honest, when Charlotte first came in, I didn't like her dress. I didn't like her hair. I was like, she's looked better. But actually, that dress grows on me. I really like the hearts kind of at the top. She's become even more charming. Is she in love? That part made me think of Little Mermaid when, like, Ariel comes down. She's like, la, la, la. And all the sisters are like, she's in love with someone. That's what made me think of Charlotte. She looks really pretty. I like this outfit. I really liked her and Griffith's conversation. I like that Griffith actually answers her question. He doesn't just like lead her off and leave her on a whim. We'll talk about that. But I feel for her too because she's, Griffith looks at her in that moment. And what's so hard, what makes Griffith so hard to read is we know he's manipulating her. He is only with her, as far as we know, to get the throne. Right? But there is a moment or two where he looks at her and it genuinely seems like maybe he likes her. Maybe he looks at her, you know, like, like, well, I could have done worse. <laughs> or he looks at her like, I'm glad his daughter's at least pretty. <laughs> you know, if I'm going to manipulate and get the throne, I'm glad she's at least nice looking. I, it's very hard to tell because there is a little part of you that wants to think that, well, maybe he does like Charlotte. Maybe he does care for her. But then there's, you know, that that's like a third of you. And then the other two thirds of you is like, no, he is just using her to get the throne. Absolutely does not care about her in the long run. So it's going to be interesting to see when he becomes king, does she die a mysterious death and it's just him ruling? Or does he keep her by his side? Does she have a kid with him? I don't know. I, I could not, I, there's a part of me that could see him having a kid with her. And there's another part of me that's like, no, that would be a threat to his claim on the throne. Why would he have a kid? So, I don't know. I don't. I just feel bad for Charlotte because I don't foresee it ending well, either for her physical or mental well-being. <laughs> I I just don't see it. But who knows? Maybe Griffith does actually like her. So then we go to the study. I I love the set piece of this room. I love the big staircase. It's very well designed because. The off the mangaka clearly thought about like how this needed to look because you have guts coming in through the window and you have the big staircase so guts could come down and attack him. Now the thing that's problematic is I'm like, why didn't he just go back through the window? Why there's a staircase and stuff? Why didn't guts just go back the way he came and get out of there that way rather than go through the nights and kill twenty people? Why did we not do that? But maybe maybe there was a jump, maybe there was a big ledge there and he had no choice. Maybe Guts didn't think about it and was panicked. Uh, Guts reminds me a lot of Lancelot and Monty Python and the Holy Grail where it, his solution is just to start killing people. <laughs> his solution whenever he's cornered is just to not run away, not logically think about the solution, but just like just barrel his way through everything. It's just, it reminds me of the Black Knight, of Lancelot like at the wedding in Monty Python and the Holy Grail just killing every guest and everyone possible. It just, it, it's hilarious. And so we go back to Hassan. I really like Hassan's character. He's He talks to Julius and he's like, hey, he's like, I understand what you're going through, man, but you should be a little bit easier on your son. I like Hassan's character. He's a nice old man that's just trying to look out for the both of them. And I appreciate that Julius listens to him. I appreciate that Julius is not above, you know, above the help giving him advice. And he's like, no, you're right. I'm, I'm being harsh. I'm just, you know, kind of... I'm just, my assassination plan on Griffith failed. <laughs> and so now I'm panicking and a little bit paranoid. So, you know, he has his reasons. And he's like, I know. I have had little success with my duties in the royal court. M referring to Griffith, due to such affairs, I've become quite irritated. Yes. And so Hassan's like, just don't overextend yourself. I like Hassan. He's a great character. I hope he sticks around. 
Hope he sticks around. He, he clearly is seeking revenge or seeking vengeance and justice for Julius. Just hashtag justice for Julius and Adonis. We'll see how that goes for you. And so then he leaves the drink there and, and walks in, bows and walks away. I, I could not help the, uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame reference when Julius looks in the fire and sees Griffith's face in the flames. It was like the, a hellfire moment. <laughs> it only, you know, Julius getting mad at Griffith. And again, Julius is, Julius has got a great body. He just, you know, that face, mm -mm. <laughs> that face and personality doesn't quite live up to the rest of him. Right. And then the, and then the candles go out and there's guts, right? Uh, the, I'm amazed that the guts just goes in and does it. I, a lot of times assassination plots in anime and manga, you know, there, there's the best laid plans and then something goes awry. Not here. No. Guts is quite successful in what he was set out to do, right? He has the devil's luck after all. We'll talk about that when Griffith shows up amongst the ladies. Um, but he just like slashes. I kept wondering if that slash wouldn't kill Julius until like a few moments after the troops arrived and he like murmured Guts's name to the troops and they'd know that he was connected to Griffith. No such case. It did remind me a lot of Sweeney Todd in Sweeney Todd where he like slits the throats of everybody and they're like, it's you, I recognize you. And then just, hey, don't I know you? And then, <laughs> that's what it reminded me of. It was a very Sweeney Todd, bar Demon Barber, Fleet Street moment. And he's like, I know you. And then Guts is like, oh my God. And then that's when Adonis comes in and sees his dad. And he's like, oh, a burglar. And Guts panics and immediately like stabs him into the freaking wall. Like Adonis' death is gruesome. It is gruesome as hell. Just stabs him into the wall. Like he's bleeding from the mouth and crying because he saw his dad die. And then he dies. It's tragic. It's tragic as can be. And then like reaching out and just like reaching out and Guts tries to grab his hand and says, Hey, like, uh, and then he just dies. Yeah. It's, it's so, it's very realistic and very cruel, but like it was that brief moment where Guts is like, Oh shit. Oh, I just, I was in my like bloodless days because that's all he's been doing is battle is seeing a threat and killing it. And then he realizes, Oh shit, this was a kid. And then there we go. And that's when the troops show up and they go after him. And Hassan, poor Hassan, like he is just like, don't let him get out alive and him crying. I feel for Hassan, like he just left. And then Guts like manages to kick open the sewer drain and run down there. So the thing with Gambino is interesting. He has the vision of Gambino saying that I just wanted him to acknowledge me. And so that's where he connected with Adonis, right? He des I desperately wanted him to appreciate me. And then Zod shows up in the dream, right? Zod shows up as the monster. So we have this, this monster of Zod shows up to get Gambino. But then we realize the monster is Guts. That Zod's not the monster. It's kind of like the subtle foreshadowing. Again, it made me think of two things. One, the like crackpot theory that Zod is Guts's real father, <laughs> which is fun, but I don't think that's true. And then two, the idea that Guts is thinking, cause Zod is this monster that's just fought endless battles his entire existence. All he knows is battle. It's what defines him and his identity. And is Guts starting to see himself as the same monster as Zod, that all he does is battle and kill people, and that's his markers of identity, right? So is he just seeing himself as this monster of destruction that's not good for anything else? Kind of like what Zod has become. So it's interesting to see like him view himself like that. And I love like I love the moment where we get kind of guts as as Zod, the monster with the teeth and the horns. It's great. And then he wakes up. I, I do like Guts with his hair down. Guts with his hair down and all disheveled. He looks younger. He looks like he did when uh, episode four, when we had the bath scene with Griffith. He looks like that. It's a good look on Guts. Um, but yeah, I, I feel bad for him because he's like hit his head. Like he also looks very innocent in this shot. Like there's a little shot where he has like the little white in his eyes and his hair's all disheveled. And he's like, man, I've got a concussion. My head's bleeding. And I got an arrow on my arm and 
I killed a kid and I don't know what I'm doing. Like, he just, he looks very innocent in that moment. You kind of just, you just feel kind of for guts because he's so simple. Let me get this toy. He's just so simple and makes you feel for him. Right? So, then we have, as he's going through the sewer, we go back to the tavern where everybody's hanging out, right? All the mercenaries. And we see... What's interesting about this is we see Pippin. Pippin's not had a lot to say in this series so far, which is fine. But Corcus, of course, is obsessed with, like, the finer things. And he's like, well, I bet Griffith is enjoying a succulent meal right about now. And, like, he's just daydreaming of what life would be like in the royal court. Then you have Judo that kind of has his eyebrow cocked, like, yeah, okay, keep dreaming. Rickard's interesting because Rickard, I don't know if it's just the way they animated him in that moment. He looks very, like, serene and somber, Rickard does. Like, he's thinking about something. It's interesting. Also, Rickard's wearing, like, the same robes as Adonis, which does not help. Although Adonis' hair was longer than Rickard's looking at him. And so, then we have Casca. He's like, there's a lot of perks that he can enjoy at the princess's evening party. He has nothing to worry about except for formalities. And then you have Casca just sitting there like, okay, like, what do we do? I, I will talk about Casca, and she, she handles this all very well. Much better than I thought she would, especially after last episode. And Rickard asks, where's Guts? Now that we're talking about it. Now, Corcus brings up, he's like, we haven't seen him since morning. And Corcus brings up the best alibi of all. He's like, oh, he's probably practicing with his sword like he always is. That's, that's such a great alibi. It's like, Guts is always off swinging his sword around. That's all he does. He's just very simple. And so Corcus is like, why would we have to worry about him? It's not like he's doing anything complicated, like assassinating somebody. <laughs> I find it interesting. I'm wondering if Guts will ever tell them that he did that. Probably not, because Griffith, it was just between them. So that's, hmm. And then, of course, Casca says he's just slacking off. Our two companies were supposed to do drills today, and he didn't show up. He never showed up without giving notice. I, I love that Corcus looks over like, are you surprised we've known Guts for how long? Like, you're still expecting him to do things? Like, I just love his face. Corcus's face there is so funny. And Rickard's like, well, there's no need to be so mad about it. Like, like we should know by now. Like, I just, I love Corcus's expression. It's really, really funny in that moment. And then they're like, damn, she's scary. And then Guts shows up. And there he is. It's almost like he... The crazy thing is it's almost like he just, like, day, dazedly walked back to where they were without even thinking. It's like he was in a dream, in a trance. He was just on autopilot and just going to where he knew he needed to go. His hand is still bandaged, by the way. After all this time with Zod, it's still bandaged. He took the arrow out, and there's some blood there. And then he's got his little knife attached, and he just looks absolutely dazed. Like, he's not even thinking. And I think Casca goes up there to yell at him. She's like, where have you been all day? And she's like, you've caused nothing but trouble, I'll have you know. And she's like, don't you care about group unity? <laughs> and she's like, team exercise 1999, don't you care, Guts? We've got a team bonding thing. Why are you skipping out practice? She wouldn't fare well on Toto's team in Kroger's basketball, just saying. She's like, why don't you just get with the team program? Where's she since Nakama? It's not like you've been out doing secret missions for Griffith or anything. And then he's not even listening. And that's when she sees that his arm is had an arrow and she goes hey was that an arrow wound and he's just like his eyes are like dead like he's barely hanging on like barely conscious and he says griffith where is he like like his autopilot reaction is i need to go find griffith and tell him the job is done like he just he like has to check in with the boss right so all he cares about is finding griffith and reporting and reporting on the assassination. Now, we'll put Casca over here, right? And say that with Guts, her initial is just anger that he's, that he's like avoiding, anger that he's avoiding the group, but then she changes to concern over the wound and the idea of his um, demand for Griffith she probably sees it as relatable, right? So we have that idea that when he asks for Griffith, she kind of like looks off to the side like, you know, Guts, like her, cares a lot about Griffith and wants to know where he is. And she's like, okay, fair enough. 
You want to know about Griffith? He's at that party. He's at the soiree at the, the prom rose palace, you know? And he's like, okay, and Griffith, and Gus just goes, okay, thanks, bye. And she's like, well, wait a minute. You can't just walk out and leave the team. You got arrow wound. I'm not finished. And I like that Rickard's like, what's wrong with Guts? And she's just kind of like, I don't know. Because normally Guts would kind of like, you know, maybe give her some attitude, give her some sass, like be like, I don't want to talk to you or whatever and ignore her. Here, he just wants to find Griffith. And she's like, okay, something's not right. He has an arrow wound. He's not, he seems like he's in a trance in a daze. Might need to go check this out. She seems concerned. And we go back to that fountain, right? And Guts is going up to go find Griffith. And when he gets to the top of the stairs, he sees Griffith in the distance, like, waiting on Charlotte. But he's standing there waiting there for her. Not paying attention, but watching her. And he goes to see him, and Casca stops him, like, no, 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 no. Or at first, he sees, he sees Charlotte. I love that Guts is like, oh, he's talking to her now. He's, he's doing whatever. I... Because, yeah, Guts and Casca, they both, they both feel like they're close to Griffith, right? I mean, Casca's big thing is that her conflict is her respect, her respect for Griffith, but also knowing, knowing his goals. I feel like Casca, especially after this episode, she knows exactly what Griffith is doing. She sees it. Like, Casca's like, he is smoozing Charlotte. That's part of the game. Sh Casca gets it. And I give Casca props because she doesn't seem jealous. She seems kind of like, it's just part of the game, right? But I feel like th that, to me, points that Casca maybe is not so much romantically interested in Griffith, but she just wants his respect. She just wants his appreciation, right? She just wants him to respect her. That's all she wants. And she is still loyal to a fault and willing to do whatever if he'll give her that respect. Guts is a little bit more complicated. Because is Guts jealous of Charlotte? I don't think Guts knows what that is. No, but Guts, he wants to be accepted. Accepted and... Before we've had the idea, he likes being accepted and taken in by Griffith and what I mean by that is that he was happy when Griffith said do I need a reason to lay down my life to help you like like we're we're comrades we're friends right there's the idea of this friendship this bond and all Guts has wanted is a bond like what he thinks that he has with Griffith right and I think with Casca it's more of respect and again the the difference with that is that Casca is a woman she gave up her womanhood to become a knight to be on the same equal playing field as the men. And sh to her, having Griffith's respect is like the ultimate acknowledgement. And for Guts, having that relationship and friendship with Griffith is the ultimate acknowledgement. So they both, they both are seeking to have that acceptance from Griffith. And so when, when Guts sees him with Charlotte, he's just kind of like, well, what's he doing? Like, what's the point? Like, what can she give him, right? What, how's this work? And she's like, oh, I'm a little tired. I like it. Charlotte plays it pretty smooth, too. She's like, I'm just kind of tired. And then Gr Griffith's like, let me put this, like, coat down for you to sit on this fountain. I was like, oh, man, God. Smooth as silk. Yes, indeed. He just sits it down there for her, like, please have a seat here. And we'll just sit next to each other and chat. Very nice. I, I love it, right? And so Guts goes up to talk to him. And Casca's like, don't screw this up, right? She's like, you're ratty in these ratty ass clothes. You got a room. He's like, you're going up there in this shabby outfit. Don't bring shame to Griffith. You better wait until they finish talking if you want to see him. And I, again, we go back to the episode where Griffith was surrounded by the dignitaries and Guts was like, I'm just going to force my way in. I think here Guts is so dazed and injured and exhausted that he's just like, whatever. But it is nice that he, he stops and considers Casca's words. And to Casca... She's framing all of this as, you know, this is part of making Griffith king. So we need to go along with it because it's what he wants and we're supporting him, right? But what I love about the scene is Casca being a little bit gentler with Guts, realizing something's wrong. And then her taking his knife from the belt and he just watches her and she cuts the sleeve of her dress and then uses the sleeve to make a bandage for him. This is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. 
this development of Casca knowing something is wrong with Guts and taking the time to go, okay, I don't get what this is going on. I don't know what it is, but just calm down. Wait out here with me. And I feel like in this moment, Casca realizes that Guts and her are kind of on the same field in terms of how they feel about Griffith. And I like the development of her taking care of Guts and him just kind of go, accepting it and going on. That's development. That's developing their relationship. I'm here for it. I'm good. I, I love Guts and Griffith as a ship, but this moment here is like a nice little chunk of, okay, you want to make Casca and Guts a ship? This is how you do it. This is that moment. And, and I don't think Guts would, you know, would Griffith do that for Guts? No. But it's a different dynamic. It's a totally different dynamic, right? But I love it. I love it. I love this moment here. It's a nice little, a nice subtle development between the two of them. And he's like, hey, and she's, and I like that she doesn't say a word. She just does it. She's like, I don't want to hear it. She's like, you're injured. I don't want to. And it's almost like she doesn't want to know how he got injured. Doesn't want to know about it. Doesn't want to think about it. Just wants to help him and then be like, okay, let's stop and, and listen to their conversation. I love it. It's great. I, I'm here for Casca and Guts for their relationship to develop. Let, let's have more of this. So we have Charlotte talking to Griffith, and this part is pretty important, I feel, where she says, I'm not into soirees. They are clamorous affairs. She's like, I'm not here for, like, the, the like, chit-chat amongst the nobles, right? She's like, this is to be, you know, held to comfort those who have fought tirelessly in battles. And she's like, but I think they should rather stop the war itself than hold a soiree. And I think that Griffith kind of looks at her. It's interesting. She's like... She's like, it's cool that we're holding this party like to comfort those fighting in battle, but why don't we just stop the war altogether than having this party? Like, why do we keep having parties rather than stop the conflict itself? She's pretty well spoken in this moment. Like, I like Charlotte saying, you know, why are we doing this? Why are we having these wars? And Griffith kind of, he the look he gives her kind of has one of two meanings. He either he's just like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> that's the mean way of thinking about it or he's actually considering what she's saying and realizing that maybe she's a little bit smarter than he gave her credit for maybe because he says you know why do men commit themselves to the affair of bloodshed you asked me that question and I didn't give you a proper answer instead I taught you how to whistle and she's like yes I did ask you that and he says that men may have he gives this monologue which is so good he says that men may have have a barbaric side a barbaric side to them yes he's like there are men who have a barbaric side to them and are only out for violence like you said but he says however it's a tool for claiming and protecting precious things so he says that war is not just barbarism it's to claim and protect precious things. Whatever you hold to be precious, right? People fight to protect the things that they love. And we've seen that in lots of anime and manga. That's nothing new. It's a double-edged sword, right? She's like, precious things. And she, so Charlotte says, is it, I'm going to put Charlotte here. Does she say it's family and lovers? Which is certainly part of it, right? She's thinking of like the more like physical romantic side of it. And he says, for some men, such things are duly cherished. So he's like, yeah, some guys fight for that. Sure. But there's one thing more precious to a man above all else. So he says that all men, to all men, what is most precious are their dreams. Oh my God. I love this. I love it so much. It is their dreams. Mm hmm And she's like, oh, okay. He says, something one pursues for one's own sake and not for any other. So he says that your dreams are for yourself. Are for yourself and no one else. That separates it. It's like when you fight battles for others, that's one thing. But your dreams are something you're fighting for yourself. They're, they're your own selfish thing. And she's like, a dream? And I like that Guts and Casca are over there like, dreams, what are we doing? Guts is like in a daze. Like, uh, what we don't realize is how much of this Guts is processing and how much is going in one ear and out the other and how much Casca is processing. We're not sure about that. 
some dream of ruling the world. So he, he gives this monologue about the dreams. For some, it's ruling the world. You know, <laughs> like Griffith. <laughs> he uses his own dream first. He says dedicating their entire life to forging the perfect sword. Okay, so it could be ruling the world or forging the perfect sword. I wonder if that is... Uh, I wonder if that's referring to himself or Guts. If Griffith is like, you know, ruling the world, forging the perfect sword. Is forging the perfect sword a, si a tie to Guts? Is Griffith saying like, my dream is to be able to rule the world and have the perfect sword by my side? And by sword, I don't mean a weapon. I mean a, a literal person, which is Guts. I don't know. While some can be pursued alone, some are like swords or storms. So I like he says that they can be pursued alone. You can do this quest alone or it's like a storm. And what does it say there? It's, it can be like a storm and destroying everything in its wake, blowing apart hundreds or thousands of other dreams as they go and destroying other dreams. Which is a really interesting way to think about it. Like, he's saying, you know, some men, their dreams are something they do alone. And others are just like a storm where they have to destroy things along the way to get what they want. Which is essentially what Griffith is doing. It's like, now the question is, is Guts by episode one going to be pursuing his dream alone? Like we see in episode one. And Griffith's dream is like the storm that's been destroying hundreds of other dreams to get there maybe maybe and he says a dream can fortify a man's life or bring suffering upon it so it can either fortify here we go it can fortify or bring suffering and it says it can make a man feel alive or kill him instead ah make alive or kill him Yup. We're going to talk about this in just a second. I'm going to get him to be done with that monologue. Even if a man is abandoned by that dream, part of it will remain smoldering in his heart. So, even if abandoned, part of it remains. Okay, so even if it doesn't work out, it's always going to be there. It's never going to leave, right? And so every man has envisioned his life in this way at least once. Like everybody has imagined a dream, a life as a martyr to his dream, his God. Mm. So he says, being a martyr to his dream, his God. Okay. Like every man, you're a slave to something, right? Mm-hmm. And then Guts and Casca, again, we go back to that same, that same image. So what this reminds me of is, again, Attack on Titan spoilers. <laughs> this entire monologue, I, I know Isayama had to have watched Berserk. There's a lot of parallels. But this whole thing reminds me of Kenny. Reminds me of the whole talk of Kenny's dream and the idea of how that dream has changed. The idea of pursuing a dream alone or being a storm that destroys hundreds of other dreams. So like Aaron and the rumbling, you have that for it. You have Erwin, Erwin being the storm destroying hundreds of other dreams to get what he wants. And then the idea of Aaron pursuing the dream alone. There's that fortifying or bringing suffering. The idea of dreams making people alive or killing them. I mean, all of the Attack on Titan characters have dreams. Either, even if it's abandoned, part of it remains and you become a martyr to your dream. So I'm like, I'm thinking of Kenny, Aaron, Erwin, all of those characters and the dreams that they have and how they shift and alter. Zeke, all of them. There are so many characters in Attack on Titan that this dream monologue could just completely encompass and refer and re refer, refer to. It's kind of staggering. But the moment he was talking about it in the episode, I was like, all the Attack on Titan references. So end of Attack on Titan spoilers. We're done with that. So then, Griffith, we get this beautiful close-up of, like, his face. But then he says this, to simply exist just because one's been born. So he basically says to exist without a dream. 
that won't do. He's like, that's not my type. To exist without a dream is a sort of notion I hate. I can't stand it. So he's like, to exist without a dream, Griffith hates. To just be a little sheeple. Mm -mm -mm. And again, that ties to the fact that maybe he does like Charlotte because Charlotte seems to have a dream. She wants to stop the war. That's something. That's a purpose. That's a dream to pursue. So, you know, she clearly has a purpose. Maybe he admires that about her. But I can't stand it. And then we cut to guts. And yeah, because this entire time, Guts has had no purpose. He has no dream. Guts literally doesn't have a reason to exist except to serve Griffith. He doesn't have his own purpose, his own dream. And Griffith comes out and says, I hate stuff like that. And to Guts, it's sort of like, wait, does he hate me? <laughs> you know, it just makes you think in that moment, oh, and so he goes, oh, and then he realizes what he said to her. He's like, oh, sorry, I got carried away. I was just going on a rant there. <laughs> sorry. Got got a little bit in my own mind. And then he's like, you must be getting bored with me. And she's like, oh, no, no, keep talking. <laughs> I've never talked with a man like this before. I'm like, girl, I don't blame you for being like this. I thought you were one of the aristocracy when I first saw you because of the way that he presented himself and the presence that he has. Mm-hmm. And she's like, but on the hunting field, when you taught me to whistle with a reed, she's like, you looked like a child. Hmm. And the way that he gives her the soft look, maybe Griffith does like her. You know, I was fully convinced he's just using her, which why not both? Right. But it's like the El Dorado meme, like both, both is good. I think that maybe he could possibly like her because she is pretty compelling as a character. I, I like Charlotte more and more. When we first met Charlotte and she was so quiet, I thought, oh, she's going to be this meek, like, easy to manipulate little girl. But no, she actually has a pretty dynamic character. I like Charlotte. I like where she's at as a character. It's cool. And, <laughs> and Griffith, maybe he does like her and appreciate her and is also using her. So I think it could be either way. And so he's like, and now you're like a philosopher enlightening me with your thoughts. Yeah. Well, Griffith is pretty well read. He's read a lot of books, right? I'm like, girl, he, he's read a book on makeup tips. He can help you with that face. Girl, he knows how to do contouring. We could, we could have fun with this. Let him help you do the contour. He's like, you're marvelous. And that look that he, that she gives him. You are marvelous. I'm like, it's just like you couldn't stroke Griffith's ego anymore, right? The idea of Charlotte calling him marvelous. I just, I was like, you just, it's like she gave him a hand job right there and then by the fountain because his face, he's just like, yes, tell me more about me. <laughs> but that is something to be said because the thing of it is, Guts and Casca, it is highly apparent that they respect Griffith, they like him, they admire him. It is very apparent that they think he is marvelous too. But neither of them would ever say it to Griffith's face because it that would maybe mess up the dynamic that they have. And what would that make of their dynamic? Like would they are they just soldiers to help him? And for Charlotte to call him marvelous, it's something different. And I, Griffith loves that. Like the look on his face. He's so pleased. Mm hmm. And so then we have, we go back and Casca just kind of looks down. Like it's almost as if Casca realizes she's able to say what I cannot. Like, because I am Griffith's soldier, I can't just go up to him and say how marvelous he is. Like that, that relationship dynamic is not there, but Charlotte has that privilege. And it's almost like Casca's acknowledging it. Like, mm hmm. Touche, my dear. Touche. Like, I, I feel for Casca. And I love how she's handling this, though. And then Guts, we don't see his reaction. Your friends must be fascinated by your charm, too. Which they are. And that's when Griffith says, they're my able soldiers. Because, yeah, I mean, Charlotte hits it on the head. Yeah, they are fascinated by him very much. And to Griffith, there's the concept of they are my able soldiers soldiers whether they think i'm marvelous or not that doesn't matter and he's like i'm glad you think i'm marvelous because that matters but he's like they are my able soldiers they are important comrades who devote themselves to my dream 
He's like, they are my devotees. They are the dream devotees. Right? They don't have their own dream, so they help me with mine. But he just established that he hates people like that. So basically he's saying, I have no problem using these people and they are expendable to me because they represent something that I hate. They don't have their own dreams, so I'm just going to use them to help my own. There we go. They devote themselves to my dream. However, they are not necessarily my friends. He's like, you think I'm friends with Corcus? <laughs> So he's like, they are devotees my dream, but we're not necessarily friends. And then he establishes that for him, a friend is an equal. A friend is someone that has a dream, someone that can stand rivaling him. In my eyes, a true friend is someone who never clings to another's dream. Yeah, so, so that, the idea of you are mine to guts where he tells him that you are mine you're part of me now in my dream it's it's like griffith is saying you are beneath me we are not equals because you are my you are my servant you're going to die for me i'm going to use you the same with everyone there casca friends nope corcus nope rickert nope judo pippin nope they don't have their own dreams so i'm going to and maybe maybe they do but you see basically establishes that all his soldiers are just devotees to him they don't have their own dreams so they're just expendable for him they're not truly friends. he's like i can't be friends with someone who clings to another person's dream which is the definition of casca so i'm like oh no he's like i could never do that Someone independent who can find his own reason to live and follow that path without guidance. So to him, he wants somebody who is independent, independent, um, has his own reason to live and needs no guidance. <laughs> <laughs> needs no guidance and then what else does he say there and if anyone tries to crush his dream protect it heart and soul and to protect to protect their dream okay okay we'll talk about this in just a second and he says even if that person happened to be me ah yes so he says they would protect their dream even if I was the one crushing it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So basically Griffith's like, I want somebody to be, you know, kind of my rival. And by rival, I mean bestie. <laughs> he says, for me, a true friend is someone who I consider my equal. And that's when Guts like falls into this pit of despair <laughs> because we see like Griffith and what he says there and then we see the disparity and the distance and the shadow between him, between, between the two of them, right? Because everything he's just described is not Guts. Guts is not independent. I mean, he was. He was independent. He was on his own, but he was depending on the mercenaries, right? He did not have a reason to live. He was just wandering aimlessly. Uh, he has needed guidance like every step of the way, whether it's been from Casca or Griffith or whoever, he's needed guidance from day one. And he doesn't have a dream. He's just kind of like, I'll help you, Griffith. What better reason do I need to live than to serve you? And Griffith's like, yeah, that's great. It's cool. Thanks for being an expendable soldier. They'll do whatever I want. I'm, I'm happy, but we're not friends. <laughs> You know, and, and to Griffith, he's like, I want somebody that is willing to protect their dream, even if I'm the one that's crushing it. So essentially Griffith, you know, he's a little bit of a masochist. He's a little bit, you know, like, I, I like, I'd like the enemies to lovers angle. <laughs> and right now, Guts and Griffith are not enemies to lovers. Mm -mm. They're friends or Guts thinks that they're friends, but they're not right. They're, they're just comrades. That's it. There's no power of the Nakama here. Griffith's like, I want my rival to be my lover. And Guts is not a rival. Mm -mm. No, and at that moment, it kind of makes Guts call into question. He's like, wait, I thought that 
I thought I was your confidant. I thought we were best of pals. I thought you only came to me to tell me all your secrets. Well, no, he's telling Charlotte all these things he's never told anybody else. So, you know, that calls into question for Guts. Like, what else have you told Casca that I don't know about? What have, you, have you took anybody else aside and told them your deepest, darkest secrets and they think that they're the only ones that know? You know, it, it kind of makes Guts completely realize that what he thought Griffith and his relationship was is not the case. And we as the audience have kind of had that assumption, but it kind of gets confirmed here. Griffith wants an enemies to lovers, and right now him and Guts are not enemies. So what do we do about that? And she's like, you have great confidence in yourself. I like that she says that. You've got, you've got such confidence in yourself, Griffith. And it's like, yes, he does. And he jumps up, and he's like, that's exactly how I attained everything, with my confidence. And then he leans down to her. I love him leaning down her face. And girl, I'd be blushing too. Hardcore. I'm allowed to talk with you, the princess of the kingdom. And she's she's so wooed. Will you tell me your dream? Yeah. Tell me your dream. And before he can answer, that's when they show up. Because I'm like, his answer was going to, I feel like his answer was going to be something seductive like, to marry you. Mm -hmm. I feel like that was going to be the answer. It was going to be something to woo her. I was like, girl, you were like hardcore wooed by him. I don't blame you. Because, yeah, that whole monologue, like, how could you not be? How could you not be seduced by Griffith in that moment? How? Right? Right. And that's when they show up to say that Julius, they're like, your cousin, your uncle Count Julius has been killed. And she's like, what? And they're like, a burglar broke in and even killed young Master Adonis. And she's like, oh, my God. The court's been thrown into an uproar. And that look, the look on Griffith's face, it's almost a little bit unreadable because there's a part of Griffith's face in that moment that looks satisfied. Like, ah, yes, Guts did the job. He killed Julius just like I wanted. But there is another little part of his face that's kind of like, this was more than what I asked. I didn't ask him to kill Adonis, but okay. Or maybe that was part of his plan, again. We don't know, but man, Charlotte just being like, oh my God, he just looks so pleased. Like I, everyone I'm using did exactly what I wanted them to do. And I didn't have to do a thing. Ah, oh, it's just so good. The hawk, the hawk. And then, so we cut down to the next moment where they're planning on fighting a few more battles to possibly end the war. They're going off to battle. Uh, the Tudor forces, and it says, uh, what tremendous numbers the upcoming battles could end the war. So there's a whole lot of troops. There's like troops spanning off in every direction, right? So we're, we're nearing the end of our, our con conquest. Who's leading the White Dragons, I wonder, if Julius and Adonis are gone? Curiouser and curiouser. And so like, I hope such a thing becomes reality. Midland's army has a guardian angel. And then they say, speak of the devil. I love that. The play on words there where it's just like, like a guardian angel. And then Griffith shows up and they're like, speak of the devil. Because he is. He's a secret devil. I am so convinced. He looks like an angel, but he's Lucifer. I'm like, ah, I love it. Freaking love it. Mm-hmm. Speak of the devil with his little spurs on his boots. And he just like sashays through like, just like, sorry, ladies, I gotta go. And that's when he runs into Foss. Uh-huh. And I'm like, Foss, Foss digs his own grave here because I'm like, you could have just left Griffith alone, but he was trying to dig for information to see if Griffith was responsible for Julius's death and to try to get something out of him. But at this point, Griffith is so confident that everything's going his way that he could not be bothered at all. And God, the moment, the moment that he turns around and Foss thinks he's, because Griffith looks so kind and compassionate. He's like, oh, I don't know whatever you're talking about with those rumors. Like, what? no, no. And then he just walks along and Foss is like, well, does he suspect me? Oh, surely not. And then he's like, surely he doesn't. And then he turns around and he says he couldn't know me. And that's when he sees him at the edge of the hall looking at him staring oh my god it's so creepy and then he turns around it's like a warning shot like just like i know what you're doing 
you're next. That's what it felt like. It felt like a you're next moment. Oh my God. Or like when I become king, you're the first to go. Then we come back and end the episode with Guts, who is, he's like, says, for me, a true friend is someone whom I consider my equal. And Guts takes the sword out and he's like, he's like, if I am good enough with a sword, <laughs> will he consider me an equal? I feel like I, for Guts, the simplest way would be if Guts could beat Griffith in battle, that would be a sign that they're equals. But I'm wondering what Guts is going to do with this. I, I feel like, I don't know if Guts really took in everything Griffith was saying at face value or, or deduced what he was getting at. I don't know. Um, but I just, I love that Guts' go-to is to grab that sword and hold it up. And, and that's his go-to move. I feel like maybe Guts is saying, if I prove myself in battle that I'm the strongest, Griffith will consider me an equal. But that's not the case. Griffith has said, I want somebody that ha that's independent, has their own dream, can, you know, protect that dream, and doesn't need guidance, which is the polar opposite of Guts right now. So, God, this was such a good episode. This was such a good episode! And I talked for an hour about it, surprising nobody. <laughs> So yeah, I, Julius is dead, Adonis is dead, Griffith is just rising up that ladder, he's like one, one ring, run rung off the top, and so then we have a battle coming up apparently, and we could possibly end the war, that would be great, so I'm so curious what's going to happen y'all, I hope you all are too, but I, I'm excited to see what's going to happen next, so in the meantime, I hope y'all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe, take care, and yeah, I'll be back very soon with more Berserk. Bye!